as being co-eternal, co-existent, co-equal, and co-essential with God, had come to rescue and redeem fallen man. The problem is he came to be the propitiation for our sins. But the word says he came, but they received him not. As a matter of fact, they rejected their Messiah. You can't get mad with them. Because they're still in this modern time in which we now live. Individuals who are still rejecting Jesus. And somebody ought to high five your neighbor and tell your neighbor he talking about somebody else now. Is there anybody here tonight that can praise his name that you did not reject him, you received him and he saved your soul? Rejected by his own people. The Jews rejected as their Messiah, as their redeemer kinmen, as their anointed one, they rejected him. And so now Jesus turns his face toward Calvary. He's already mentioned this fact along the way. He's dropped nuggets along the journey. Listen, if you please, tear this temple down. And in three days, I'll build it up again. Listen, if you please, that a nugget he dropped as Jonas was in the belly of the well. Three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the earth. Jesus came to the earth knowing his very purpose for which he was being sent. But before Jesus' date with destiny out on a hill called Calvary, the place of the skull, Pilate's killing ground, Jesus takes his disciples, he takes the twelve away from the crowds, away from the needs, away from the pull of the people, away from the tension, away from the pressure, away from the petty politics of Rome, away from religion, away from persecution. Matthew says he takes them out into the region of the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Right there in the northeastern section of the Golden Heights, a city that was founded by Philip and named for himself and Caesar Augustus Caesarea Philippi, he takes them right there. He takes them to give them, my brothers and sisters, their final examination. Because he's about to board that cloud back to heaven, he's about to go back home to sit on the right hand of his father. And before he goes home, he wants to make sure that he's leaving his work in the right hand. I'm going to feel a little better here directly. Can you turn and tell your neighbor you got to make sure if you're going to leave your work, you leave it in the right hand. And so it's in this secluded and solitary place Jesus would give them a final examination. He wants to make sure that they were adequately prepared to carry on the ministry, the message, and the ministry in his absence. On the southeastern slopes of the Mount Hermon, adjacent to a spring related to the shrines to the Greek god Pan, Jesus is mindful that he's going to leave the work in their hands. And so Jesus says to them, what? What are they saying about me? Now there's somebody here tonight, I hear you protesting by the lack of your amen and the elevation of your eyebrows. You don't care what people say about you. But you ought to tell your neighbor, yes you do. That's why when somebody lie on you, you get all, I don't hear nobody. That's why when somebody takes your name and puts it on the wings of the morning, you get frustrated. Talk with me, somebody. All right, preach Marvin Wiley. You're going to do it here tonight. Is there anybody here tonight that knows that you can get frustrated by what people say about you? Jesus is not desiring to take his pole from the people, his cue from the crowd, nor is he interested really in what they are really saying about him. He's got to get to another question. Jesus says, right there in Caesarea Philippi, whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? The Son of Man, that title comes from my brothers and sisters, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. 
It is a name Jesus the Christ takes as he journeys through this world. The answers are varied. They are various. As a matter of fact, every disciple had an idea of who they thought it was, who they thought he was. As a matter of fact, as Jesus traveled and traversed along Galilee, along the Judean hillside, some said he was a blasphemer. Others suggested he was in a league with Satan, while others suggested he was a wine bibber. Some suggested he was a false prophet. Others suggested he's a lover of sinners, while others suggested he was hostile to the Mosaic law. But the answers were wrong. Because you do know you can have wrong answers. It's the final examination. He's not a blasphemer. He wasn't in a league with Satan. He wasn't a wine builder. He wasn't a false prophet. He, wasn't a, he was a lover of sinners, but not in their understanding. He wasn't hostile to the Mosaic law. I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to put some meat on it. Only a handful really saw who he was. Only a handful really knew who he was. Even his own family didn't have an understanding of who he was. And that's indicative of the fact that everybody in your family don't know who you are either. Come on, help me preach till I feel a little better. And tell your neighbor, everybody in your family don't know who you are. His own family members were mixed up and messed up about his identity. His own brothers, his own family were unclear about his identity. They did not totally believe he was Christos, that he was redeemer, kinsman, that he was the anointed one. They didn't know who he was. Now Jesus says, whom do men say? In the original language, what are the Jews saying about me? Ah, they had various answers. What are men saying about me? Who are they saying? I am. The son of man am. Now the answers are very, they fell off the lips, my brothers and sisters. Some say, you're John the Baptist. Herod, my brothers and sisters, was a victim of that damnable rumor. He believed, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus the Christ was John the Baptist. In particular, there was a superstition they, that aligned with my Matthew chapter 14 and 2. But I want to suggest to you tonight, he's more than John the Baptist. He's more than some wilderness prophet. He's more than some eater of honey. I don't hear nobody. He's more than just some prophet in the wilderness. Is there anybody up in here going to do it, Marvin Wiley? Is there anybody up in here that can testify? He's more than John the Baptist. Tell your neighbor he's more than some wilderness preacher. He's more than John the Baptist. He's more than some forerunner. He's more. Others suggest you are Elias. In essence, he, you're more. You're like Elijah. You are a great miracle worker. And we watch you work marvelous, mysterious, majestic miracles. We watch you turn water into wine. We watch you heal the lame. We watch you raise the dead. We watch you cause the deaf to hear, the blind to see. We watch you feed that massive multitude on a Judean hillside with two sardines and five little biscuits. We watch you do that. We watch you cure the disease. We watch you give hope to the last, the least, and the lost. But I want to suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, even though Malachi 4 and 5 suggests that the Elijah, the great prophet, would be sent before the end of time, he's more than Elijah. Yeah. 